What's up, everyone? This is Peter Neal from GSP REI, and you're listening to the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. This podcast is designed to help both active and passive real estate investors take their real estate investing game to the next level so that you can grow a successful real estate investing business or find out what to look for when you're investing passively in a real estate investment business. Let's get right into it. All right, first episode of the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. I'm Peter Neal. I'm here with uh, my partners, Ron Lockhart, Wade Carroll. Gentlemen, how are you feeling today? Feeling good. Looking forward to this. <laughs> awesome. Wade, you look like you're uh, you're you're in Montana in the in the woods of Montana there. Yes. So I'm doing well. Okay. Very nice. Well, Let's get right into it. You know, for the first episode, it would probably be good to uh, give a brief introduction of ourselves and uh, the podcast and you know stuff we want to talk about, and you know, then we'll just get right into um, into the meat of it. So, Ron, let's start with you. What? Uh, why don't you give the audience a little bit of background on uh, on who you are and and why you're why you're part of the podcast and what we're doing here? Sure. So. I've been in and around the real estate space for better part of 25 years at this point. Uh, I got started in the construction industry in the late 90s, uh, building single family homes. Uh, that evolved into more of an investment business where we were purchasing um, Multifamily, smaller multifamily properties, uh, specking homes down in the Jersey Shore. I live uh, in the Philadelphia area. Um, was in that that was pretty prim the primarily the focus for probably the first ten years of my career, and then I made a, a jump to the uh, to the finance side, where I was a partner in a commercial and residential real estate firm in New York. Um, then 2008 happened, the world, the real estate investing and the rest of the world got turned upside down, um, started focusing on consulting coming out of, uh, that, that period, um, and really have just tied everything together since then, uh, our current business, we utilize construction, we utilize investing, we utilize asset and property management. So it's kind of come full circle over 25 years. Cool. Wade, give us a little uh, a little background on what you got going on. Um, I am the president of Anders Capital Group. I'm a member of GSP REI. Uh, I've been playing real estate since 96. I think that started with a few uh, small motels that we renovated. And then around 2002, we started accumulating rental units in Texas, mostly Houston and Dallas. Uh, we amassed about 650 before 2008. Uh, there was a couple years of licking wounds after that, but it it pushed the the company towards buying notes. And I've been buying non-performing debt mostly from from HUD since then. So. We do a lot of construction with our notes. We do a lot of workouts, a lot of REO. So that's about it. Gotcha. And we'll take a, a deeper dive on everybody at uh, some point along the way in the show. Um, you know, my background is in investor relations, capital raising, uh, corporate strategy. You know, I, I started with a distressed mortgage company that was a uh, small company that was looking to get a lot larger and, and expand into other uh, asset classes and things like that. So got a lot of um, taste of a lot of different consultants and things like that to help a business get from, you know, uh, get from one little thing to, you know, expanding over time. So, um, you know, like I said, over over the course of the podcast, I think we'll we'll take a deeper dive into everyone's background and history and how the three of us got together. And we're all the uh, partners in, in GSP REI, which is a, uh, a 
real estate investment company focusing on single family affordable housing, um, specifically uh, rentals. Um, and that's kind of where this podcast is coming from is, you know, and where we got the name real estate investing on point. So that that's kind of been our slogan since day one, right, Ron? That was um, kind of came out of the GSP theme. And uh, one, one question people ask me all the time is, what the heck does GSP REI, what does it stand for? Most real estate investors can can get the the REI part as as real estate investments, but um, GSP. I literally I got this question yesterday on a call. Somebody was asking me what GSP stood for, and um, I wrote an article on the site a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about that because it was it was something that meant a lot to really the three of us. Um, Ron, maybe you're, you're the, you're the guy with the GSPs way too. Oh, um, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a beagle man myself, but you can, <laughs> <laughs> you could talk about, you know, how we came up with that name and, and why it stuck. Yeah, we were, when we were thinking of a name for the company, we were trying to think of something that would be representative of what we do and how we go about our work. And uh, you know, anybody who's familiar with uh, German short hair pointer dogs knows that they're they're working dogs, they're field dogs, and they really know how to uh, sniff things out. So we like to believe that the way we go about our business and the way we go about finding deals is through hard work and sniffing out the good ones, getting rid of the bad ones, and just keep uh pushing forward and, and wade you're you're a gsp guy right you got uh one right now or and you've had you or you've had them throughout your life or what's what's your gsp yeah, story we, we grew up with gsps so but yeah I, we only have one at a time <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the only crazy one that has two <laughs> that, you know, they need a lot of exercise they need a lot sure. of exercise <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a, a beagle and uh, she she needs the exercise, but not like them. You know, there, there's one I think I've told you, Ron, there, there's one in the neighborhood here and this dog just glides around the yard. It's it's scary how fast he can get from one side of the, the fence to the other. It's it's amazing. It's just like it, it's like they prance or something. So. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it was a, a fitting name for us and our attitude towards the business. And, uh, they are hunting dogs and that's kind of where the on point com comes from. What's the, Ron, what's that, the on point phrase? What does that, uh, what does that mean in like the so hunting space? G GS, well, they they, when a, a bird dog points, um, it's called pointing. You'll see their one paw pull up in the air and they're pointing at a bird or whatever their uh their their target is so to speak so that's where the on point comes from yeah the tail goes back and yeah. uh they're they're focused in on the prey um so and you can see that in our in our logo too we use that um <clears throat> so one one thing for us i think we we didn't want to 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 have a name that kind of uh, limited us to any part of the business because the the background in real estate between the three of us and other members of the team uh, is pretty diverse. Um, we look at more from a, what's the best opportunity in the space. And I think one thing that brought us all together was the agreement that single family, specifically affordable housing was a great opportunity. Um, so Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, I mean, I think, you know, the, this the point of this podcast and, you know, the conversations we're going to be having on a weekly basis is going to be, you know, not just single family affordable housing, but looking at the real estate market as a whole. Um, but obviously, you know, we're we believe real estate investing on point and, and an on point strategy. Another thing for on point, too, I think if you look it up in the dictionary, it's it's like, you know, it's it's per perfect or, you know, it would be people use that term as oh you're on point, uh, you know, you're on your game. And um, the way I look at, you know, what we do uh, from a strategy perspective when it comes to single family, when it comes to affordable housing, I think is, a, is an on point strategy in, in the real estate world right now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how we how we all ended up in, in GSP and, and investing in single family affordable housing and what it is that we we like about it. And, uh, you know, and then as as the episodes go on, we'll talk more about strategy and, and how we do what we do and all that. But, you know, what's kind of what's the things that are happening in the market right now over the last couple of years and specifically now that's kind of 
led us into the single family affordable housing space? I mean, I think, you know, Wade and I both mentioned earlier, we lived through 2008. And I think 2008, in a lot of ways, was the genesis for the the problems that we're seeing in the housing market today. Um, you know, we have a, a, a very low supply of, of single family homes on the market currently, um, you know, and, and that really goes across all spectrums, you know, the different markets, whether it be um, middle market, high end, low end, um, you know, we obviously are focusing on the, for, for our business, the the workforce and affordable housing space, where I believe that's where the biggest crisis is at the moment. Um, but across the board, we, we have an issue that really does go back to 2008, um, when we were probably about 10 years over built, built going into 2008. And now post 2008, you fast forward to 2023, and we're probably 10 years underbuilt. Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, how we got here. Um, you know, I think institutions played a big role in this. Um, post 2008, you had firms like Back, BlackRock buying up billions of dollars of non-performing loans that a lot of that eventually got converted into single family rentals. And that took a lot of the inventory off the market, even back then. So to me, that was kind of the genesis of, um, you know, where we are today. There's a lot that's happened, you know, from from then to now. And that's certainly things we can talk about. But um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that you know that time frame that that Wade and I both experienced kind of that's when the train left the station yeah and and Wade to hop over to you you know you you come from a uh, a hard asset background and then you know getting into notes um you know you're you're a big believer in in the single family rental side affordable housing side uh, what is it that you know through your past experiences that have led you to that point today I don't know. I, I like single family rentals because there's there's more than one exit if you juxtapose that to a, a multifamily, uh, which is more single use. Uh I I I like the multi the multi use aspect of single family homes. If that makes sense. It can be a rental, it can be a single family home. Uh but I, I agree with Ron. I, I think the genesis of this was was a wait from a from an inventory perspective. I remember reading articles back in 09 and 10, uh, how many large home builders and regional home builders went out of business. And then some of the big, uh, you know, like Cole brothers and whatnot, how many acres, thousands of acres of land that they had owned back then waiting to build. And they had to liquidate all that. And then I remember CEOs making comments that, they would never again build to this scale that they had been prior to 08. And I, I think a decade later, that's kind of where they are. They're still under building from where they were in, in 08 and 09. And uh, there's just not the inventory that's out there. So you, you first, especially new construction. And to that point, there was, you know, I was watching something this morning. They were They were speaking directly to this. Leading into 2008, new home builders were building about a million homes a year. Post 2008, it dropped to two, three hundred thousand a year. So, yeah, you know, fast forward 15 years, you're losing a lot. You're not having a lot of new homes come on the market, and and that's re- traditionally where they would fill the fill the gap, and it just hasn't happened. So you guys bring up a good point, and uh, I think something we should dive into a little bit deeper. Uh, right now, you know, if you listen to the news, whether that be mainstream or or stuff on YouTube and things like that, social media, um, you know, I think the real estate market's been crashing for the past couple of years, right? People have been calling for, you know, this this downfall in pricing similar to 08. I think we're probably past that at this at this stage of the game, you know, it got some attention, but it didn't happen. And, uh, you know, so what do you guys see as the biggest difference between the the market now and, you know, what what you went through in, in 2008? And, uh, you know, let's let's talk about that for a little bit. I think I think people 
expect to crash only because we've seen property values run, appreciate so fast in such a small period of time. So they all think back to, oh, this looks like 2006, 2007. But the environment is entirely different where you had, like Ron said, probably 10 years of oversupply back then. And the reverse is true today. Uh, we can look at interest rates and, and maybe try to make a claim that, well, affordability is going down uh, based on interest rates. But but we're, we're seeing, even though rates have run from whatever, three or four points to seven now, uh, has not budged property property values. And that's because of inventory. And I think probably from now to the next 10 years, inventory will continue to be the primary driver, you know, unless there's some other crazy economic event. Well, yeah, and you have to look for like what are the potential catalysts that could create more inventory? You know, right now you're fighting record homeowner equity. It's something like 43%, which is insane to think about. Over $4 trillion of homeowner equity. A lot of those loans are at three, four, maybe upper max 5%. So there's no there's no motivation unless it's a life event for somebody to sell that home or refinance that home. Um, you know, one of the cat catalysts that could, could potentially bring some support Apply on the market, but it's not in the near future. Is you know there there are people that had arms that were three two three two 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 point seven five three percent four percent you know three year or five years seven year arms, but they're still a few years down the road. And really, what percentage of the overall loan market did that make up? So if you look at near term catalysts you know it's really hard to find something um because there's not a lot of motivation for people to sell at the moment yeah you bring up a good point and and may, it might be good to put it into perspective you know so what do you see as those near term catalysts like either the economy has to go down um or there needs to be a burst of inventory on the market right is there anything is there another possibility of something happening that could that would drive prices down or well if you talk about the economy or anything slowing down say wages coming back where would they have to come back to 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 facilitate people selling their homes just how far um and you know that that's a real difficult question to answer because when people have you know interest rates hovering around three percent i think their wages would have to come back pretty far for there to be a catalyst for them to sell. Um, so, you know, you look at a four, you know, the big, you know, a lot of the conversation today around people purchasing new homes is affordability. And you talk about interest rates being, you know, 30 year fixed interest rates being over 7%. For, for a lot of people, that is not affordable. But, you know, you're talking about some people who have interest rates that are less than half of that. So I think that that the, the wages would have to constrict pretty significantly for that to be a catalyst. Um, you know, there's always the potential for anomalies in the market, but you know, there are people far smarter than I am out there watching that. I, I, I every day I try and think of a reason or find something a catalyst that would would cause you know that anomaly, um, kind of like in 2008. Um, but when you look back at 2008. You know, and you, and you use common sense. It wasn't much of an anomaly. You know, there were signs all over the place that that, that was going to happen. Um, so, you know, I think it's real hard to find catalysts right now for for there to be a greater supply of inventory. What's your take? Yeah, the only thing I can think of is if interest rates drop to five, which I think yeah. is un, un, unlikely. Because they say ninety percent of the the mortgages out there are under six percent. 90% or under 6%. That's that's staggering. So if you if you drop to 5, that's going to unlock a lot of people that are in that 5 and 6 range that have, you know, those pent up sellers that haven't been able to justify selling because their rate, you know, they they'd have to replace it with a 7. That could do it. But you listen to the feds, they're still worried about inflation. You know, I just don't see a 5 on the horizon. Um I think I, I think we see an eight before we we see a five. But 
Sure. Well, let, let's let's take a deeper dive on on the interest rate side of things. I mean, I think it, it's it's certainly having effects in the multifamily side of the business. Um, what do you guys? What, what's your prediction on uh, on rates and where they're at? And and as a real estate investor, you know, how does it factor into into decisions right now? And and then you know, modeling and underwriting for the future. Well, yeah. To Wade's point, you know, I, I don't think the the Fed is done quite yet. They have their target interest rate, and they want to get us there. Um, you know, they're obviously inflation is eased to one extent or another, but there are st still areas that are, are really be they're more geopolitical that have an impact on inflation that we just don't have control over. I mean, you look at natural resources like gas and oil, oil more more specifically, that, you know, that's beyond our control. The war in the Ukraine is beyond our control. All these things can have an impact on inflation. So, you know, how the Fed chooses to combat that, even the things that are beyond our control. Um, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. None of us do. Um, but they certainly seem to have they're, they're sticking to their target interest rate and they're going to do what they feel like they need to do to get it down there. So the wage point, you know, I don't really see rates coming back much. If anything, maybe tick a little bit higher first. Uh, you know, I don't think they're going to go too much higher. I think today the 30 year was at 7.13, something like that. Um, but we certainly could feel a little more pain there. Um you know, until they get the, the target interest rate where they want it. Yeah, we passed around that Wall Street Journal article that discussed the neutral rate. And and I, I did that it has increased since, you know, back in 08 or whatever. But uh, yeah, when, when you, you consider the Fed trying to trying to keep inflation and employment in check, and it necessarily has to rise to where it is now, which I think is they call it five five is the neutral rate or something like that. But which which causes me to believe, okay, so what's going to happen to knock them off that? It would have to be some cataclysmic event, or we're going to sit here in this stagflation kind of uh, episode for five or ten years. Um, and frankly, I think that would be kind of good uh, if if you if you have rental homes. Uh, if you if you have inexpensive debt on assets that are appreciating, um, I kind of feel like we're in a nice spot right here. Now, how that affects acquisitions and liquidations over time is uh, a bit different. But uh, I think we're going to be, uh, barring a cataclysmic event, I think we're going to stick around here for five years in this range. So how does that drive decisions moving forward? What do you think, you know, the the average investor, mom and pop type investor, what do you think they should be doing? Because I think rates have probably, from what I hear when I talk to, you know, hard money lenders and, and things and people like that, you know, people have kind of slowed down or been intimidated by the rent hikes. Um, what do you think is going to give? Well, I, I think it's going to continue to cause the builders to not build. Yeah. I think I think they're they're obviously building, but they're not building like they were because they're, they're worried about affordability. Uh, as far as GSP, we buy distress, right? So we're coming in up under the market anyway. So even if we, if we're stuck with a seven, if we refi at a seven, our entry point is so much less by virtue of our ability to acquire and renovate the way we do. Um, so, if, so if I was counseling someone to get in the space, I would say buy distress. So what what about Buffett buying uh, stock and all the the top builders and all? What do you think about that move? Well, the home builders, I mean, they've had a little bit of a run lately, um, you know, because you know whether it be they're getting a little more comfortable with interest rates and at least predicting it. I mean, for for a while there, the volatility in the interest rates, you know, uh, you saw new home starts really drop. Um, because they weren't going to go out on a limb and and, and, in, a, and in such an unpredictable environment. Um, it seems like there's a little more stability so they can they can project going forward for that. And there's obviously a very a very um, 
you know, there's there's a big supply issue. So they know that, you know, in certain markets they can fill that supply and they can move houses. But there's no question they're being very cautious. They're not being cavalier about this. And and those stocks had already taken a hit. So um, you know, I, I think everybody's gonna be cautious um until there's a little more certainty in the market. What are you thinking, Wade? Were you were you uh look like you were <laughs> I was looking gonna... like you had a thought there. I was going to check some stock prices real quick, but um, as far as the the builders go, right, uh, we're in a historic undersupply. So, I mean, obviously they're going to try to hit a certain price point, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be getting behind them for a decade right now. I mean, we're we're short however many millions of homes. Who's building them? So, I'd be buying stock. Yeah, that, that that definitely makes sense. Um, so what's uh, what's your thought? You know, I, I like what you're saying about, you know, the distress, because I, I don't think that, you know, buying build, building new homes is necessarily the only answer to the question. So th- there's obviously uh, and we kind of we kind of led into a discussion around like the affordable housing crisis in in, in America and just um, you know the access to to more homes in general. Um, so it, it seems like there needs to be a combination of of new build, new construction, and then renovating distressed and and uh, existing properties. Is would you yeah. guys agree with that? Well, yeah, but, and, and you have to look at the timeline for each one. You know, a new, a new home builder development can take years. You know, from acquisition to um, you know to approval to then you know actually building homes. I mean, you could look; it could be you know three years, five years. So there's a different timeline that they have to project for. When you're when you're working on distress, you know your timeline could be six months. So it, it's a it's a totally different risk profile as well. Um, so I, I do think. You know, the blend of the two is is necessary. Um, one one can they both solve a short term problem of, sol- of supply, but one takes a lot longer to to solve that problem. Yeah, you you make a good point there, especially with, with zoning and uh, and just those parts of the land development process that yeah uh, you don't have to deal with from a distress perspective. Um, definitely makes for a different different time time frame. What's your thoughts, Wayne? Yeah, I was just pulling up Toll Brothers, and yeah, they just tipped off to their five-year high, which is also their 52-week high. So it looked like they peaked out above 75. But yeah, I mean, everyone's buying home stocks right now, builder stocks. But So when you guys look at news, you know, like the headlines and things like that, um, I think it's easy. It's easy to just kind of look at the headlines, read the headlines, and and maybe walk away with a uh, a thought on on the market or something like that. But I feel like with real estate, it's so uh, sp- you know, location driven, and way that you know, especially for you when you're in you know forty plus different markets. I mean, how do you look at uh, the headlines and and things like that? Because I wouldn't. I think you'd always have to take things one step deeper, and and you know, do do you look at the headlines? And then where do you go from there? Oh yeah, we we watch the headlines, and and I mean we do most of our research in to- internally. But when you're looking at a portfolio of loans, and you know a, a bunch of them are in Phoenix versus uh, you know Baltimore or Tampa Bay, uh, those, those big markets, and we all know which ones are hot. You know the the Boise, Idaho's, and. Uh, we back off those. We we bid them down because they they have reached a peak and and started sliding back down. Is it dramatic? No, but certainly the market is softer there than than most of the rest of the country. So, for instance, this last auction we we bid a bunch of California loans, which normally we avoid, uh, just because there there's so much demand for them. We we tend tend to focus on other uh, markets, but we didn't buy anything coastal. We we purposely looked at counties that were more inland, uh, where your price points are well under five hundred thousand dollars. So if you look at our 
the assets we've sold in the last 24 months, if it's, you know, 350,000 or less, usually we get multiple offers within the first week and it's, you know, under contract by the second week. The only time things begin to languish are if we're in a place like Boise uh, and we're above that $500,000 mark. Otherwise, you know, sub 500, they're still flying off the market pretty much everywhere. Save some of the big, the big, uh, sexy markets like, you know, Phoenix or whatever. Yeah. And we should take a deep dive in a future episode on, on market and, and market research. You know, obviously it's such an important thing for investors, um, to understand the markets they're in and the intricacies of it. Ron, we were just talking the other day about, you know, looking at the data on like Baltimore's appreciation rate over the last 10 years. And I think it was around, you know, just under 7% or so. But yeah, that takes, when you're looking at an entire city, uh, there, there's all different parts of the city. And depending on the type of properties, you, you, you know, areas you buy in and things like that, it's going to vary. Um, so what, what would your suggestion be? Or, you know, what, what's, how do you look at the headlines versus, you know, what's going on in reality and what you're experiencing in, in the day-to-day -day life? Well, I think it's really hard right now to take any of the headlines and any of the data just at face value or surface value. Um, you know, and, and I'll use Baltimore as an example. Um, I think they said there was maybe a 0.04% pullback pull back in values in the last 12 months, if I remember correctly. Um, but when you're looking at a market that has such an undersupply of newly renovated or newly built homes, and, and right now I'm specifically talking about Baltimore City, not like Baltimore County, um, and you have homes sold on auction sites for that are dilapidated, they're they're not livable, they're falling apart, you know, 25,000, 35,000, 45,000, you have, you know, the majority of the homes that you're seeing transacting are at that price point. And then you have, you know, the top 5% of the homes, you know, that sell for, you know, you know $200,000, $180,000. All those homes that are transacting at the lower dollar amounts are affecting the average home price. So you can't, look at it on the surface and say, you know, this market is pulling back because there's been a pullback in the average, you know, home sale price, because that's misleading. You know, if, if those homes were renovated, they would be selling for that higher price point. So yeah, it's apple and oranges. Yeah. Totally. I mean, you just can't anymore today, these kind of blanket statements or blanket articles that are just making general assumptions I think it's irresponsible and misleading. I think you really have to look at the information. You have to dissect it, dissect it, and it takes a lot to do that. And it takes an understanding of the specific markets. So, you know, look, I, I read lots of articles. Uh, you know, every time I see something that catches my interest or that you know has something to do with our focus, I read them. Um, but I would say, you know, sixty, seventy percent of the time, there's just much more to the subject than what the article is is articulating. Do you, do you think they're really using those auction site transactions as part of that average? Yeah, because they're going into public records. So, oh. you know, if you see, you know, say there's 100 transactions in a month, and I'm just using round numbers, I'm not saying that's what it is. And you have, you know, 60 that transact below $50,000. And then you have, you know, 20 at 110, you know, 10 at, you know, 200 and another 10 at 250. Well, it's, it's going to skew the average. It, it just, it, yeah. it's inevitable. I figured they were just pulling it off MLS. Well, that's all they pull up. They come up on the MLS because they're public. Oh. Record. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So I, like, I mean, they get, they get listed as a sale on the MLS. Yeah, that's a huge skew. Those yeah. are entirely different products for yeah. all intents and purposes. You know, at the end of the day, you can you can say that about a lot of different markets. Now, you know, we're talking about a metropolitan area that has a lot of blighted homes. Um, you know, we're not talking about, you know, um, 
like Bozeman, Montana or somewhere like that. Right. You know, so I think you got I, I would think that's where the average investor is, is probably investing in those areas. Right. And you know I mean, I, I would think that's probably, um, you know, the average real estate investor that that's where you're going to find cash flow. That's where you're going to make you find deals that pencil out. Um, so I think you bring up a really good point about, you know, taking that, that next step into market due diligence and, you know, well, preparing this to, you know, and take it a step further and, you know, in other markets, whether it be Philadelphia, New Jersey, you've had so many of these homes trans that transact at, at one, one price, right. And then you have people that are rehabilitating the homes, whether, they're a landlord or they're an end user, they're creating value, they could sell them for probably a lot more, but you're just not seeing those transactions. Um, and that's why I think you have to look at, at, you know, the fact that we're just not seeing the transactions, because there is such a lack of supply. And it, it, to really understand the numbers and where the market's are, are are at from an appreciation standpoint, it takes a lot more due diligence than just, you know, a, a, a 15 paragraph article that just, you know, spouts off some statistics. It just doesn't, it doesn't do it justice. I, I think it's created a lot of uh, opportunity in Baltimore because I, I think, you know, the, um, and, and, and in just, you know, those neighborhoods and cities that are similar to it, in the sense that I think a lot of investors don't go much further than the headlines. I mean, so they see a headline that that says something negative, and then they kind of just take it at face value, and they don't go any deeper than that. Um, but you know, th we talked about a bunch of different topics. I think the, the we're we're right now with what we're talking about is a good topic that we should take a deeper dive. Let's put a bookmark in it, and uh, in episode two, let's pick up. Um, you know, knowing your market and and taking a deeper dive and how to get past the headlines and things like that. So, um, great talk, gentlemen. Uh, let's we'll, we'll catch you on uh, on episode two. Well, there you have it. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Investing On Point podcast. Be sure to subscribe and join us live on one of our virtual meetups. You can find more information on our website at gsprei.com. That's gsprei.com. Thank you again and God bless. We'll look forward to catching you on the next one. Thank you.